Hi everyone, I hope you guys are having a wonderful Saturday afternoon. I wanted to come on live today and change things up a bit. Um, in light of recent events, I wanted to take a little break um, from talking about this virus and change the topic of today's video about why and how we should talk to our kids about race and racism. It's interesting because while this virus has really been at the forefront of so many of our minds, and especially my mind for months now, recent events with George Floyd and the protests that are happening all across the country that started last night are almost more worrisome to me, than, uh, namely because of just how long racism has been a problem in our country. And although I don't have a magic ball, I am certain that somehow, some way, we're gonna find our way around this virus. Whether it's a vaccine, it's a treatment, or it just magically starts to fade its way out, I don't believe that we're going to be dealing with COVID-19 in two years or five years or 10 years the way that we are dealing with it today. But racism has pervaded our country since the earliest of times. And I don't know about you, but I almost feel as though it's getting worse and not getting better. And I worry about the future for our kids because if it's getting worse now, I can only imagine what it looks like in 10 or 20 or 30 years. So I started to ask myself, what can I do to help change this? And while I definitely understand that Martin Luther King said that protests are the voice of the unheard, protesting isn't necessarily what I wanna do personally. Honestly, it makes me a little bit nervous and scared because I feel like at the drop of a hat, violence can start to erupt and people can get hurt. And I just don't know that that's exactly what I want to do um, and be out there. I don't oppose it by any means. I just don't know that it's for me. And so that's when I actually came across a post on Instagram called The Conscious Kid. And one of these posts discussed the importance of talking to your kids at a very early age about race. And it even cited some studies about why this would be important. And I'll share those in the comments. And at first I sort of disagreed and I thought you don't necessarily have to talk to them at a young age because they're watching you. And if your actions are good and you are a good person, you are accepting of all colors, then your kids will be too, right? Wrong. I started to think of my own life and a few of my personal experiences and my patient experiences and realized that this doesn't always hold true. So let me share a few instances with you. My family fled East Africa in the middle of the 1970s due to political turmoil with a tyrant that happened to have the same last name as us. And when I say fled, I mean fled. They literally um, got on a plane with all that they could carry and left. They, could go, they were going anywhere but where they currently were. And ultimately they landed in London, Ontario, which is on the Eastern border of Canada and made their way down a little bit and ended up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And that's where I was born. So I'm the first in my family to have been born in the States. And a year later, we moved to Bakersfield, California, which is where I grew up and is where I live now with my family as well as my parents. And at the time that we moved here in 1975, Bakersfield had a largely Caucasian population. And then there was a handful of Indian families. And that's really who made up my social circle as I was starting to grow up. And when I was about three years old, I was put in a private Christian preschool. And then I went to kindergarten at the upper school that was linked to that preschool. And for the first time when I was in kindergarten, there was a little boy in my class that I thought looked like me. And by saying looked like me, he was actually half American, half Japanese, but he had black hair and dark eyes and his skin was not as dark as mine, but darker than what I was used to in my other schoolmates. And at five years old, I assumed that we had to be friends because we looked alike. And when we played house in kindergarten, I assumed that he and I would have to be the mom of a dad of a family because we looked alike. And my parents had never had this type of discussion with me at the age of five. It's simply what I had assumed on my own. Maybe conclusions I drew from what I was seeing in my own social, social circle or on television. But again, these were not discussions I had with my parents. And then going forward a little bit in eighth grade, 
I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but um, the first time I had an African-American classmate was when I was 13 years old. And I was also a little embarrassed about how intrigued I was by her. Her hair was different than mine, her bone structure was different than mine, and I wanted to study her, but I knew that it was rude to stare at people. And I remember catching a glimpse one day of her hands, and specifically right here on the border where the dark meets the light. And I was kind of surprised at that because there, there was a contrast there. And then I looked at my own hand and I saw that I had the same thing. So I'm literally 13 years old, noticing something on my own hand that I hadn't appreciated. And it just helped me to realize how similar we actually were. And then I'm gonna go a little forward even more to my adult life. So we have some close friends um, and in that couple, the dad is African-American and the mom is half Chinese and half Italian. We've all been friends since college. Our oldest kids are five weeks apart and our youngest kids are only three days apart. So they have been come, become incredibly close to us, particularly as we've had kids and they are essentially our travel buddies for life. And it's great when we travel because nobody knows when they see the eight of us who's married to who and whose kids belong to who and we have a lot of fun with that we used to visit them quite a bit too both when we lived in la and as well as um, now so one day when isla was about two years old she was good friends with the son whose name was evan and um, they would see each other as often as they as they could we went to the post office together and she saw another African-American boy of a similar age, literally broke out of my arms, started running towards him, screaming, Evan, Evan. And she was so excited to see her friend. I was mortified. I couldn't believe that my two-year-old, who I thought was really smart and really eloquent with her words for her age, did not know the difference between that little boy and her friend, whose name was Evan. And the reason was because she just hadn't been exposed to that many kids that were African-American. More recently in clinic, I had one of the cutest patients, blonde hair, blue eyes, pigtail, and she came from the sweetest family. And I had actually known them um, since she was almost born. And when I walked into the clinic room for her three year well visit, she looked at me and then she looked at her mom and she said, mama, the doctor's so pretty, but she's so dark. And this poor mom, I mean, the color drained from her face and she just wanted to crawl into her, under a rug. She could not stop apologizing. And again, I knew this family. I knew that that wasn't her sentiment. I know this is a three-year-old who's just saying exactly what came to the forefront of her mind. Um, I didn't take any offense to it, but I used it as an opportunity to explain why it's so important to show kids other children and other adults who look differently from them as early as possible. And I was happy to be that person for this little girl. And I share these examples because I wanna to demonstrate to you that we have to talk to our kids about race and ultimately racism. What they derive for themselves as what's normal is not always true. And again, I see this in my own clinic, everything from bowel movements to healthy relationships. Kids will often determine what is normal to them based on what's comfortable or what their friends tell them. So as parents who are not racist, I feel that it's really part of our jobs to expose our kids to other people of all colors um, in person, in books, in cartoons, on their screen games, um, preferably not the violent ones, such that when our kids grow up, they don't feel awkward or different when they're exposed to people of other colors. They don't feel defensive and they don't feel scared. And what's more than just not being racist is being anti-racist. To teach our kids to be the friend to that person who looks a little bit different, that's playing by themselves or having lunch by themselves or the person who's being mistreated in their workplace. Teach them to use their voice and to offer a helping hand so that they can be the change that we want to see. And even for those of you who aren't racist, but maybe you kind of feel a little bit uncomfortable in certain groups, or maybe you notice it when you are the only person of your own particular race when you're in a group and you don't like that feeling. Let's help our kids 
not have those same feelings. And perhaps they can go above and beyond how we feel so that they can have a better place to live. And so you may ask, why do we need to address these issues so early on? Because even as young as three months of age, babies will look at faces that match the race of their caregivers more than other faces. At three months of age, by two and a half, kids will often use race to choose their own playmates. And again, just like the story that I mentioned about myself when I was in kindergarten. And think of those adults who have never flown in an airplane or never been in the ocean as kids. As they become adults, flying or going on a boat in the ocean are really high sources of anxiety for them, particularly on their first few exposures. Well, why is that? Because they can't fathom that there's a machine that flies tens of thousands of feet in the air and that it's gonna keep us safe and not come crashing to the ground, or that being in the middle of the ocean is gonna prevent them from getting eaten by a shark. So again, if you expose kids at a young age to flying or being out in the ocean, they often don't bat an eyelash with those activities as older kids or adults. So what exactly can you do? Well, for younger kids who are not quite verbal, I would say maybe under two months, 18 years, you wanna to try to, your best to expose them to people who look different from the rest of the family. Um, the same way that you would do different activities to help them meet their developmental milestones, you want to incorporate this as part of their exposure. And I know that's a little bit difficult right now with social distancing and everything that's happening with the virus, um, but in the long run, utilize your friends and your neighbors and let them know what you're doing because then you can share those experiences with them and perhaps they'll do the same thing. Um, as I mentioned, have their dolls, their figures, their books, their cartoons, their screen games, incorporate people of different color and point them out that we are similar, just like one another, even though we look a little bit different on the outside. And this by no means just applies to Caucasian folks. We all need to be doing this across the board, whether our kids are white, black, Hispanic, Asian, or mixed, it really doesn't matter. We need our kids to be comfortable with who they are and who is around them. And so as kids get older, that's when we wanna start having appropriate discussions with them um, in addition to exposing them to the things that we talked about above. And I've broken down these discussion points um, by age group to help out a little bit. So for younger kids, age two to five, ask them questions if they see someone of a different race or different color. Does that person look like you or do they look different? How are they different? Do you like him? Do you like her? How come? And engage in a little simple discussion about that and help answer questions if they have them. Um, for kids who are five to seven, ask them about school and say, do you see kids that look different than you? How are they different? Do you play with them? Ask them why or why not do you play with them? And then going into that age group of seven to 10 years old, ask them, how do you feel or when you talk or you hang out with people that look different from you or who are from a different race? Do you have certain people that you prefer to hang out with and how come? What kind of cliques do you see at school and how does that make you feel? And do you like the color that you are or do you have questions about your own color? And finally, for those older kids above the age of 10, again, depending on their maturity level, you may even wanna bring into discussion current events and ask them, do you know what racism is? Do you see racism happening when you go to school or you go to your friends' houses? Do you understand what's happening around the country right now? And how do you feel about it? These types of discussions about interracial friendship and current events can dramatically improve their racial attitudes in as little as a week. So it's so, so important to have these discussions. And I know it's not quite the birds and the bees, but I know it's not easy either. And I hope that this video provided a little bit of insight and guidance as to what each of us can do in our own homes, in our own circles, to stop the chaos that is going to affect our future generations if something doesn't change. It's gone on far too long, and I truly hope that our kids are going to be the ones who will help to stop it. So that's it for today, guys. I hope that was helpful for you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And as always, thank you so much for listening.